Oh God. Okay. So we'll now begin the second session this morning, which includes several presentations from speakers in the energy field focusing on opportunities for clean energy. Following each speaker, there will be a few minutes for a couple questions from the audience. So I would like to welcome our first speaker, Mary Quintana. Mary is currently Director, Asset Management and Utilities at Brock University. She holds a bachelor's degree in electronics and telecommunications, engineering, and a master's degree from the Tecnologico de Monterrey. In addition, she holds a master's of environment and sustainability from Western University. Mary's professional experience includes research and development on biomedical technologies, as well as strategic consulting with a focus on innovation and technology management. Over the last decade, Mary has worked in the university sector, advancing energy management, sustainability, and decarbonization. Please welcome Mary. <laughs> He's getting ready for the panel later. <laughs> Good morning, everyone. So without further ado, um, I'm going to talk to you about some overarching information, and we'll go into more detail in more presentations as we go forward. I want to start just making sure we're all on the same page about district energy, because it's something that I'll be talking about the whole, the whole time. So what I mean with district energy systems, and we already heard from Wayne this morning about district energy, these are underground infrastructure assets that supply energy via thermal exchange between buildings. They are typically based on a central plant that supplies all of the buildings, but there's also distributed systems. It's not a new technology. It has been around for at least 100 years. And you, you can find very ancient systems in Europe. They have been very common for a long while. In North America, we have a ton of systems too. But we continue to build new ones. Uh, there's a new one built right now in Ottawa, um, for example. So it's not something that's done. And what we have is what we'll end up with. It continues to grow and it continues to, to be at the front page when it comes to decarbonization and energy management. Um, some of the more prominent uh, examples of district energy is uh, Copenhagen. The whole city is supplied by low temperature hot water. It's one of the, the, the most advanced systems that there's in the world right now. Uh, but also, Canada is very proud to have N-Wave doing some of the, the advancements here, too, with the Toronto uh, Lake Cooling System. And I know uh, N-Wave will be speaking about it later, so I will not steal their thunder, and I would not do justice to the project. But just keep in mind, it's, it's something that is constantly evolving. It's here to stay, and it has a very important role to play. But why district energy system? What's... What's all about it? Why it's so sexy? Well, it is because it has economies of scale built into it. Given the size and the, the, the scope of, the, of these systems, it really allows you to, to benefit from reduced cost, enhanced efficiency. You have your systems running always at a better uh, performance because you don't have one system and then it's uh, outside of the efficiency range. You always have a mixture of buildings, a mixture of solutions that you can work with that gives you that benefit of uh, economies of scale and efficiency. Resilience, that's a very important one. When it comes to climate change, you have to think about mitigation. You have to think about flexibility. If boiler A goes down, then you want to have maybe a thermal energy storage tank that you can discharge while you repair the boiler. You have an outage from the grid. Well, then in the meantime, what are we going to do for electricity to keep our communities safe? All of those things come in play, and district energy systems are specifically well uh, thought of for supplying that flexibility and that resiliency. Last but not least is carbon reduction. When you have a standalone system in a building, that's all you have. 
That's your footprint. That's what you can do to decarbonize your building. When you have a district energy system, you have many sites, many buildings, and each one of those represent an opportunity for decarbonization. And at the same time, when you make a change in one of your systems, they are bigger. So the impact that you end up having is also much bigger. And again, that advances you much faster in the, in the road to decarbonization. But it's not unicorns and rainbows only. There are some setbacks. And some of those challenges would be the increased complexity. These systems are, uh, are larger. They tend to be more complex. Even a smaller uh, district energy system can be a complicated one, especially if you're in incorporating new technologies, decarbonization with uh, renewables, um, cogeneration or even tri-generation. It gets more complicated. But again, uh, you, you're faced with uh, ca higher capital investment. When you are first installing your system, of course it's going to be more expensive because you're building not for one building, but for many buildings or maybe for your whole community. Um, one of the biggest difficulties with a system like this is you need to think long term. You know what technologies are available right now, you know what the challenges are right now, but you don't know what it will look like in 50 years from now when you still have pipes in the ground, when everything is, is operating, what will happen? The regulatory environment will change. How would that affect you? Technologies will change. So you have to always be thinking forward. And last but certainly not least is policy and guidelines. You need to make sure that you have strong policies so that whoever is connected to your en district energy system has efficient systems. If you let everyone build and operate um, in, in a very energy intensive way, you'll need to build a new plant in two years, and that's not what you want. At the same time, you want to make sure that it will be utilized, that you are not just sitting on stranded assets that you can't really connect to. So those are some of the intricacies of district energy. For Brock, it has not been uh, that difficult. Uh, we had the fortune of having very uh, visionary leaders uh, in the 60s and, and after. So they, they set a good pathway for us. What you see, it's a trip to memory lane. So that's just Schmone Tower, the, the very first buildings back in the 1960s. There was no natural gas. So all of our buildings, they were electric buildings. They were heated electrically, cooled down electrically, everything. So in the, 19, the late 1980s, natural gas became available. And that's really where the visionary decision was made to install the district energy system. We have tunnels. They decided to go, even back then, 25 years ago, with hot water. And you may hear in the news that U of T and Queens, they are just starting to decarbonize by going from the high intensity um, steam, the high, uh, high carbon intensity steam production to hot water, which is much less carbon intense. And they already made a decision for us in 1992. So some of those advantages have really played in our favor. We have a tri-generation system. We have cogeneration engines. They are reciprocating engines. Um, the, the heat that we release from those engines, it's recovered in an absorption chiller. So all, we also produce electricity, we produce chilled water, and we produce hot water for the whole campus. And we certainly have grown a lot. And the plant was modernized in 2018. Now we have um, eight megawatts of capacity for generation, but we still conserve our thermal energy storage, absorption chiller, centrifugal chiller. All of that remains the same. We just modernized all of our assets. That's in the center. The thermal energy storage is, is, is just water not uh, ice or anything, but that means we can use it both in the summer and in the winter. When it comes to the transition, really it's about integrating everything that you can. Um, we are uh, lucky that we have land, so in the future we could look at what can we do with some of those lands. Maybe when we retrofit a building, maybe we can put some solar thermal here, maybe solar PV on that other one, but again, it's the, the ability that it provides us with incorporating not a single solution, but smaller solutions for each building, and at the same time also tackling the buildings themselves. Economies of scale, as I mentioned, 
it's one of, the, one of the advantages that you don't have to convert your whole system at once. It provides you with more flexibility to do that transition. So when you are making one change, for example, and I'll talk uh, about it in a moment, electrification, when you electrify your district energy system or include a different asset, then the, the advantages just expand to every system that it serves. So that's pretty important. And again, on those aspects, we're talking about climate change mitigation. But I already talked about it, climate change adaptation is just as crucial. Um, it was before my days at Brock, but I keep hearing the stories from people that have been here much longer than me, how Brock um, was the, 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 the light um, in 2003, we had the lights on, thank you to the cogeneration plant, when there was an outage because of an ice storm, we had power, we could provide our community with, with power. So that's something that reliability and resiliency are at the forefront when it comes to climate change mitigation and adaptation. When it comes to the transition, it will not look the same for everyone. You need to manage your technology, you need to know what to incorporate at what time. And there's no um, cookie cutter solution. For example, uh, what we're doing with electrification here at Brock right now, maybe it will not work for downtown Toronto because U of T is landlocked and Toronto Hydro doesn't have the capacity to supply them that power. So you really need to see what you can do. And there's a place and um, an, an advantage to each solution. You just need to really think it through and plan ahead. Make sure that you are doing not the what everyone does, but what really works for your community, for your facilities. Um, the capital investment, you will have to plan for that in the future. Even if it's a new system, you have to plan for, for tunnels, for piping, and then when they reach the end of life, you also need to plan for the change. You need to plan how you're going to be staging those transitions. How do you not interrupt the, scene, the, the services? And it's something that Brock, we faced that in 2018 when we replaced our um, domestic uh, water system. When it, it was a bit of a challenge, but the system was not interrupted. The whole campus remained operational for the duration of the project. So it's something to be aware of, but again, it's doable. It can be done. It has been done. I keep telling my team, are Danish more smart than us? No, they're not, we're just as smart. We just need to, to find what works for us. Now, what are we doing? Our transition to clean energy, and I already alluded to it, it involves electrification. We, are, uh, we received a grant from the federal government under the Low Carbon Economy Fund, $2.9 million, for um, converting some of our district energy system into electricity. Back from the 1960s, when we had an all-electric campus, we have the electrical capacity, we have the transformers, we have the buses, everything that's ready for, for electrification. So we are just bringing the systems back to life. They were mothballed, so we're reviving those. Uh, we're including new buckets, we're, having, we're purchasing new boilers, electric boilers. We are keeping the plant. We're not going to unplug it. We, we have that resiliency need for, for our community. But the plan is to run the engines less. We are going to be installing heat pumps. All of those things combined to better operations, um, monitoring, all of that will have a significant impact. We have uh, estimated uh, a reduction of 67% in carbon reduction by the time we're done with that project. And at the same time, meeting our campus needs. But it's not all about electrification. Um, and while it has a great great solution, a plausible solution for us, we also want to remain flexible. And one of those is really um, data. We need better data. And we installed a new SCADA system. We have an energy management system that we also deployed. But there is an important component, a crucial one, and that's engagement and education. We have heard about it this morning. Um, how it is important to have everyone at the table participating. And we figured out that we didn't have that engagement at Brock. Many of our students, our faculty, they don't know we have a, a district energy system and the advantages of it. So now we have, this is just um, a, a short time, but we have real-time information available for the community. They can see on real time what the plant is doing. What the district energy system is, uh, we have some fun facts there to make it easy to, to understand for everyone. 
And now, before, we were doing one to two tours per year. Now we're doing one to two tours per month of the district energy system. And we're happy to do that because we believe in the importance of engagement. Technology will only take us so far. It's really when you are involving people and changing behaviors that that will take you to the finish line, as, as we like to say. But we didn't stop there. We also uh, developed, in partnership with a consultant, an app. And through that app, we're doing competitions. We are engaging our community to do sustainable actions, anything from commuting to campus, to saving energy, water conservation, and, and the results. This is just the numbers that, that you see. Um, 15.6 thousand kilograms in CO2 reductions, 123 thousand liters of water saved. It's massive. It's a lot. It's not district energy, but it's part of the solution as well. If we don't educate people about having a, a better use of our resources, it doesn't matter that we have a district energy system, very efficient, decarbonized. The cheapest kilowatt hour is the one you don't use, and that's really the way that we want to continue operating. So just to wrap up, um, district energy system has a huge role to play in when it comes to the transition to clean energy. It's not easy, it's going to look very different for each one of us, and it will continue to change. Even if you already have a district energy system, it will change. But it can be done. It, it, one of the, 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 the great exam examples that I can think of, it's, it's really with, with Brock, with our electrification project, where we are really capitalizing on what we already have, what um, previous leaders had already built for us, and we're reusing a lot of that infrastructure. We are addressing deferred maintenance with some of that, and we're also decarbonizing. So there are ways that it will not be uh, straightforward necessarily, but you can find those solutions, and you really can leverage on district energy systems in this roadmap for decarbonization and to fight climate change. And that's all, thank you. And I'm happy to take any questions. Yes? Right now, it's actually a waste recovery heat pump. Yes, we are using it in one of our research intensive buildings. We are going to be uh, taking some of the waste heat that we have in some of the, their handing unit coils, and then we're going to use that for cooling down the building, reducing the load effectively in that building. But it's um, a very unique application uh, that we are finding for that heat pump. It's really a heat recovery chiller. Uh, that we are using for, for that solution, but it's that particular application that we're able to, to capitalize on it. That'd be great, thank you. Oh, there's a question there in the back. We have looked at it in a couple of instances. For, we looked at solar PV for residence eight. Um, unfortunately, the height of the building didn't allow us to, to put the solar PV because it would be above the tree line, thinking that being on the escarpment, we, we can't have any, any structure showing above the tree line. That became the, the hurdle there. We did explore it. Last year, we also looked at solar thermal for, uh, for our pool. It was going to take 26% of the, of the load of the, um, of the pool in a dedicated system. Unfortunately, the roof was not strong enough to withstand the snow drift, so we had to abandon the project. It, became, it would have been a demonstration project, and we wanted more than just a demonstration project. So we continue revisiting solutions as the technology, that, um, solar panels, they are now becoming thinner and thinner. Now you have films that you can put on your windows to become solar panels. So we're, at, we're waiting for the technology to do that. And at the same time, when we are re-roofing, we are keeping in mind the load so that we are not constrained again by, by those uh, challenges. There's another question there.
it will, it will be for, for both. We will continue running them during the, the peak days because certainly the, the price that we pay under the ICI program as Class A customers, it's very, very favorable and it does enable us to, to have a good business case for electrifying because we're, we're, we can balance our budget and make sure we don't overspend on electricity. So we will continue doing that for the plant, but we are estimating to run uh, like that maybe 160 hours per year. So it's very, very minimal. But we also have our research intensive buildings. We have millions of dollars and uh, priceless research really from decades uh, of research from, from our faculty that we have to protect. So we will continue providing the redundancy and we will continue having the buildings connected to the cogeneration system just for those power interruptions that we, that it, it happens and we will continue protecting our assets that way. Any other questions? No? Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mary. Don't walk away. Hold on. And we have our little incentive for you. Thank you so much. We really appreciate that. And hopefully in the future, the region and Brock University can partner on some of these initiatives. Um, so our next speaker is Richard Montoya. Richard is the manager of capital assets at York Region Transit, a branch within the regions of York's public works department. He is responsible for managing a team carrying out the planning, design, construction, operations, and maintenance of transit assets, including fleet and facilities. In his role, he is leading the delivery of the region of York's. Sorry, got to turn my page. You got a long bio, Richard. York's Fleet Electrification Plan, which aims to transition the region's bus fleet to electric bus technology by 2051. Please welcome you to the podium, Richard. Hi hey everyone, I won't take any uh, credit for that bio. It's corporate communications, of course. Uh, I just provided my name and they did the rest, which is interesting. <laughs> uh, but yeah, I am uh, Richard Montoya. I guess we'll wait for this, this headshot to go down or I have to hit the button, there you go. Uh, I am Richard Montoya, I'm the manager of capital assets at York Region Transit. Uh, so York Region Transit is a branch within uh, the regional municipality of York, an upper tier municipality. Uh, located uh, just north of Toronto, for those that aren't familiar. Uh, York Region Transit uh, operates its service uh, throughout all of our uh, nine municipalities. Um, you know, over you know, 1.2 million residents uh, with a lot of growth projected in our area, so it's a, it's a growing area. And our regional council is, uh, is very um, supportive of all climate change initiatives, which I'll, I'll get into. And in particular today, what I'm going to focus on is um, more so on the fleet side of things. Uh, there are quite a few facility-related facility um, and dependencies with the fleet uh, electrification plan. Uh, but yeah, I need like over an hour to kind of marry the two. So we'll, we'll focus on fleet today, but I'll, I'll gloss over some of the facility stuff as well. Wanted to thank the hosts uh, on behalf of York Region uh, for extending the invitation. Typically our director of transit, Kyle Catney, would do this pre presentation, but uh, he's, he's caught up in some council and committee uh, items. Uh, so, so I'm here instead and hopefully I can entertain and maybe uh, educate uh, a little bit um, so really the context for this presentation, and this is something that we've, we've done in the past with other transit agencies, is just uh, to provide kind of our roadmap or our journey, uh, how we got to where we are now, uh, which is with a fully uh, council endorsed and funded transit fleet electrification plan. Uh, there's no, uh, I think within the transit uh, community, you know, everyone's doing uh, what works for them, and I think that's something else I'll touch on. So there's no right or wrong here. Uh, you know, I'm not here to kind of tout what the region's done as uh, you know, the gold standard or anything of that. It's really just to provide you with kind of uh, our journey, some of the lessons learned along the way, and then maybe there's uh, something that the group can take back and you know, is applicable to, to your work and, and the organizations that you work with. 
before I get into it, just so I know who to avoid, is there any transit people in the room? <laughs> oh, there you go. <laughs> so for the q and I'll, uh, I'll try to not look in that direction and get grilled with the hard questions. <laughs> for everybody else, uh, hopefully, you know, you can take my word that everything on here is factual and great and, and we'll be okay. So yeah, just like I mentioned earlier, so the Regional Municipality of York, third largest municipality in Ontario, uh, sixth in Canada, growing, made up of nine municipalities. Uh, the urban uh, corridor along the, the, so the southern portion of, of York Region, we call it the inverted T, is really where a lot of the, the growth uh, is. In the region, it has a lot of our uh, higher ridership, uh, areas, our rapid ways, our connections to uh, TTC subway, connections to rail, things of that nature, but we do cover a large geographical area and we provide various service to even our rural communities up north in Lake Simcoe. Um, so that large geographical area is kind of what poses a, a challenge for us and, and has posed a challenge for us in providing just our regular service and then Adding the, the transit fleet electrification to it uh, resulted in some uh, additional costs and things of that nature. But all in all, uh, I just wanted to kind of give everybody an understanding of um, you know, where we're situated. Uh, and yeah, if anybody's ever in York Region or wants to stop by and learn something uh, transit related, feel free to, to reach out and, and we, can, uh, we can definitely facilitate that. So just getting a little bit into our service to give you a sense of, of what we uh, provide at York Region Transit. So we are a transit agency that was uh, amalgamated in the early 2000s, or sorry, formed through amalgamation in the early 2000s uh, for, from the, the various municipalities. They, were, they had their own transit agencies. Uh, they all got amalgamated under the YRT banner. Uh, we offer different types of services, so conventional transit service, rapid transit service, our mobility service, both paratransit and on-demand, kind of uh, not fully microtransit, but, but uh, close enough. We operate uh, various fleet types, uh, so we have 40-foot you know, buses, 60-foot buses, uh, some 30-foot buses, uh, paratransit-style buses, uh, and they're all at the... Mo or, um, were all previously diesel and gas uh, technology. Offer connections with, like I mentioned, TTC, Go, Rail, uh, partners with Brampton, Durham Region Transit, uh, wherever people need to move or it makes sense and there's a demand, we try to kind of fill that demand. We do have uh, an operating fleet of 12 electric buses in service right now. We have 14, we just received two this year, we just have to put them into service. And one thing that's a little bit different uh, for York Region Transit is we do have a contracted services model for our service delivery. So we, um, we own the assets, so we own our fleet, we own our facilities, but we contract out the day-to-day the -day operations and maintenance of that, uh, of that service with, with oversight and administration on our end. All right, so this, uh, this next slide, uh, I'll, sp I'll spend some time on it here, and there's some things uh, not covered on here, but the region uh, has a Vision 2051 document, which outlines some you know, lofty goals and targets. Uh, namely, by 2051, the region of York wants to be net zero for all its fleet and facilities. Um, so with that, uh, there's obviously have to, has to be some plans and some strategic documents to get there um, and a lot of work. Uh, so our energy and conservation demand management plan kind of outlines the various initiatives that it's going to take to get there. Uh, so myself being in transit, it really what that means is all your facilities and your fleet have to be net zero by 2051, figure it out. Uh, so with the rest of our public works department, uh, we kind of developed a greening strategy, which got more into the, like the granular details of, of how to get there. Um, and really early on in the conversation and in, in the uh, kind of analysis, it, it, it was uh, decided upon to you know, do what's kind of tried and true, get the low-hanging fruit or find the, the most bang for your buck, that kind of thing. 
And a lot of data collection was, uh, was carried out and, and analysis, and that's really what's presented in these two, um, these two pie charts. So it's clear to see that transit and you know, the over 700 vehicles that we have on street uh, every day, the 25 million miles or so that our, our buses are on the road every day generate a lot of emissions. 58% um, of the region's emissions, if you want to look at it uh, on the pie chart there. And uh, on the second part of that, the cost associated with it is, is, is significant as well. So our diesel uh, costs and you know, what, what, it, what it takes to fuel our buses and get our buses out into service is, uh, is uh, sorry, squinting here on my side, 20, about 24% 20, of, of the annual energy cost for the region, which um, you know, anyone could look at and, and say, hey, you know, if, if we target these two areas, we'll, we'll do two things. We'll, you know, have accomplished uh, reducing, you know, 58% of the region's initiatives as well as uh, saving some money uh, on the diesel and the energy side of things. So this next slide's a bit of a busy slide, but it's really just to kind of outline the, the, the timeline. And I think the takeaway here is, uh, at least for, for our organization, and this predates me and, and my predecessors and, and so on, was you know being in, a, in an upper tier municipality, uh, being formed of you know regional council members, which essentially is all the, the local municipalities. We really needed to get consensus and buy-in from everybody uh, involved in order to have um, a survivable plan that could kind of withstand uh, all the various factors that you know municipalities and governments have to deal with. So things like provincial elections, municipal elections, changes in federal government, funding changes, uh, things of that nature. So really what we set out to do is kind of take a very methodical approach, you know, a little bit uh, very deliberate, making sure that we collected data along the way, making sure that we engaged all of our stakeholders, making sure that we had regular touch points with council uh, to provide updates, and then to lay out for, for our council a recommendation that kind of checked off all the boxes uh, with a, a phased approach, right? So no one wants to be the early adopter. I think there's a lot of risk adverse in government, which is uh, just the name of the game really in government. Uh, but you know, if we can have some consistency in our policy and programs, I think that helps everybody uh, at the table as well as uh, our residents and our, our taxpayers kind of understand that you know, we're not making decisions on a whim, and there's, you know, evidence to kind of support some of these things. So just uh, from left to right, yeah, it's, we started in, in 2016 with uh, what's called an alternative fuel study. Uh, so that was the very first step in the process, which is trying to understand what fuels or energy sources are out there to, uh, that would meet the needs of our transit fleet and um, you know, taking that a step further, uh, landing on a recommended technology that we could take forward for uh, implementation in a pilot, you know, carrying out the pilot, collecting all the data, uh, working with our, sta our stakeholders to you know, improve on that pilot and have some incremental growth. And then carrying out a full-blown feasibility study that would kind of say, okay, you know, we've been able to transition 12 buses over the last uh, three to four years. We have 700. This is what it's going to take to get there on the capital side, on the operating side. These are the benefits. These are the risks, so on and so forth. And through all that, I think what we've been able to do is put ourselves into a position, which uh, I'll, I'll, I'll touch on shortly, uh, to take advantage of uh, certain things that could come up, uh, namely funding. Oops, sorry, there you go. Uh, so the, the key topics, that, like I mentioned in the alternative fuel study, were, are, are listed here, but, but generally speaking, uh, you know, we wanted to do an industry scan of what was out there. Not, not everything from a zero emission standpoint is, uh, can be put into action, and depending on your geographical area, as an example, you know, in, in, in Alberta, areas like that, you know, they have natural gas readily available. Whereas here, you know, things have to be kind of trucked in, in, in some cases, you know, there's, there's other uh, challenges that uh, come up with, with different technologies. So we had to make sure that we kind of did a scan of what was out there, what, what made sense for us, 
uh, getting into the financial details of it as well. And then the big thing, which I'll touch on on the end, is, is just the challenges associated with the technologies and, and kind of daylighting it and, and doing our, our best to, to be um, open and transparent in terms of what that means for you know, being on schedule and, and making sure we're operational. So after uh, carrying out the, uh, the alternative fuel study, uh, we, we took that you know, next step of um, like I mentioned before, uh, developing a, a roadmap or an implementation plan for a full-blown transition. So this was um, taking the recommendation from the alternative fuel study, which said, you know, for your specific area, for your specific uh, jurisdiction and, and needs, uh, battery electric bus technology was most suitable. Uh, now let's look at it with a little bit of a closer lens. Uh, you know, how many of your routes can be serviced as is? Do you have to change anything operationally? Uh, infrastructure, you know, can your current garages and terminals support the technology? Um, you know, what types of bus range do you need? Battery pack sizing, uh, you know, what opportunities are there for uh, facility um, improvements where you can kind of leverage things like solar PV, battery en energy, storage systems, peak shaving, all those types of things to, to, uh, to help with uh, the operational costs and even operating our service. So that, that feasibility study was, you know, presented to our council and, and um, fortunately enough with with all of that plan uh, in place, they, were, they provided us with uh, some approval to kind of enter into uh, a, an integration trial with uh, Qtrix. So Qtrix, the Canadian Urban Transit Research and Innovation Consortium. <laughs> but it's made up of transit agencies throughout Canada, some industry partners, uh, and so on. Uh, the goal of the, the, goal of the, the trial was um, you know, to develop bus specifications, charging infrastructure specifications, some standards uh, for the Canadian market, um, and then, you know, work with vendors uh, to uh, demonstrate, collect data that could be used for uh, future decision making. So in the end, uh, it was, you know, Brampton, Zoom, uh, Transit, we had Translink, Translink uh, Siemens and ABB uh, participate with, with YRT as well as two uh, bus manufacturers, Nova and New Flyer. Uh, and the trial technically continues because we're, we're um, continuing to share data with all the agencies that is both uh, shared with non-participating agencies. Uh, so, you know, so anybody can you know, leverage the data obtained through this, uh, through this trial for, for future decision making on their end. Like I mentioned before, we, we wanted to make sure that we covered all our bases with our stakeholders. I think this is important. So we, we kind of looked at it from six different categories. Um, and uh, this, this slide kind of shows that. So a couple of things we learned, which we, we knew going into it, just with all battery technology. I mean, if you leave your, your iPhone in the car and you come back, you know it's going to have uh, you know, quite a bit of, uh, of a lost uh, battery life if it's a cold day. And that there's no difference on a bus. So we are seeing that there's you know, about 25% or so battery loss due to cold weather conditions. Now you can look at it from two ways, that's a big problem or it's an opportunity. Um, so you know, that's kind of where we need innovation as an example with you know, future uh, engineering or manufacturers to find ways to, to deal with this. Uh, secondly, from a customer experience perspective, so we had a bit of a marketing blitz campaign, you know, had on-street staff kind of surveying staff or surveying our, our ridership and, you know, I think it's positive. I think the only thing that we've heard is that they're too quiet, which is, uh, could be a safety risk. So we actually chirp in some noise uh, on the buses when they come into terminals and stops so that, uh, you know, you can hear the, hear the, the bus uh, zoom in, which is interesting. Uh, drivers, uh, one thing that, just like anybody else, I don't know, I, I personally don't have an electric uh, vehicle myself, uh, but if anybody does, maybe you've had the same experience where, you know, there's a little bit of anxiety on battery life is what we're hearing from the operators. Everyone's thinking their, their bus is going to just, you know, die on them on the side of the road or they're going to have the, uh, 
you know, rapid battery loss, that type of thing. Uh, but we've been able to kind of manage that with our, our drivers. And other than that, yeah, they, 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 there's a lot of torque and power in the vehicles, which is well received. So there's benefits to, to them as well. On the operating side, one thing that we did know that was going to come out through our feasibility study was we were going to see some operating impacts on the uh, maintenance side of things. So we're about 30% uh, savings so far. And really, it just comes down to parts. There's a lot less parts on an electric bus than there is on a conventional diesel bus. Less parts, less replacements, less maintenance, less labor. It's, it's fairly straightforward. So. We're still early on. Our buses are only a couple years old. We'll see what that means for the full life of the bus. Uh, but yeah, early results are, are pretty good. Uh, the last one was just on the charger usage. You know, is there people familiar? Are they comfortable? Is it you know, too big of a hurdle to kind of overcome? But we have two different types of charging installations. We have an en route charger, which is an overhead charger at one of our terminals. And we have in depot chargers, which just plug in overnight. And there hasn't been any, any issues with that. Um, and then just lastly, the environmental impact, which I'll, there's a more focused slide down the line. So we've, we've put in over 800,000 kilometers or so on our 12 buses over the last three years and uh, ends up being about uh, yeah, 700 tons of CO2 kind of uh, savings, or sorry, reductions. So like I mentioned before, after all of the legwork, the trial, the alternative fuel study, the feasibility study, the stakeholder engagement. What we managed to do in 2020 was take a plan to um, our, our uh, regional council. Uh, and really what we wanted to do was demonstrate how this proposed undertaking or the proposed transition aligned with like the region's strategic plan. So, you know, big, big uh, high level things like there's economic vitality for this, you know, there are local vendors, there's, you know, opportunities for local vendors to, you know, reap the benefits of this overall program, which is roughly $2.5 uh, billion versus the business as usual case, which continuing to just run diesels about 1.7 billion. So there is a premium on it, uh, obviously, but uh, yeah, there's opportunities to kind of, um, uh, provide that economic vitality. The other one is healthy communities. I think it's fairly straightforward, reducing emissions in, uh, in urban and corridors and, and areas that we service. Uh, sustainable environment is another big thing that our council looks into, the technology here, very sustainable, uh, green, and, and then good government. Uh, and the good government side of things is just making sure on both the capital and the operating side, the expenditures, uh, you know, the budget impacts are all daylighted with, you know, best available information and, and forecasts. And um, I think one of the things that benefited us was, yeah, that operating savings as well as the savings on the energy side, uh, just moving away from diesel as well. And kind of show how it, it lines up with our you know, vision 2051 of, of being net zero. So, you know, checking off all the boxes for them, we were able to get an endorsed strategy. Um, so this is fully funded, fully endorsed by our council, which uh, pretty much outlined that as of 2030, we would no longer be buying any diesel buses, fully transitioning to purchasing electric buses. By 2048, we would be fully transitioned to electric bus. And between now and 2030, we would be making uh, infrastructure improvements, so charging equipment, things of that nature at our facilities so that we could be pre prepared for that full ramp up. And just for some context, so full ramp up, you know, the 700 buses or so across our garages, that's about 25 megawatts of, uh, of power needed to kind of power our fleet. Um, and uh, what the types of things that we would be, sorry, oops. There you go. Um, the types of things that we would need to do to get there uh, required a lot of uh, um, input and coordination with utilities in the area as well. Uh, so just moving along, uh, like I mentioned before, I think what we were able to do, which which is uh, you know a lesson learned, is you never really know what's coming ahead of you. Uh, there's you know changes in government, things of that nature, but sometimes it works in your favor. Uh, so in this particular case, 
the federal government did announce the Zero Emissions Transit Fund, so that's a, a federal fund with some uh, partnership with CIB, so Canada Infrastructure Bank. Uh, and really the goal was to have 5,000 zero emission buses across Canada by 2036, end of 2036, uh, which is a bit of a, a lofty goal. Um, but nonetheless, uh, because we had kind of all of our ducks in a row, we had you know a council endorsed strategy, we had our own budget secured, we were able to put up our hand and submit a project uh, to, the, uh, to the fund, uh, and we've been successful. So what that means is during the funding window, so between now and 2026, the end of 2026, the, the region's actually going to be purchasing 180 electric buses. Um, fairly aggressive, definitely accelerates our original plan. Uh, I think everyone is aware of the challenges ahead of us, uh, but we do have an opportunity here to get um, grant money, which is, you know, free money, let's say, uh, and then also some, some low interest loans from CIB and considering the economic climate now with what we all see with rising interest rates, the terms are favorable to, uh, to the region and, and, our, and our finance department. So, you know, would we have been able to, you know, seize this opportunity if we hadn't done all the legwork in advance? We probably could have, but at an earlier stage. So the fund would have allowed us to submit, but only for funding associated with all of the work that we'd already done. So, you know, feasibility studies, all the consultancy, that type of thing, but they would not issue any uh, funds for a capital investment unless the legwork was complete. Yep, so I'll, I'll just zoom ahead. I got the, the one minute hook here, but... Uh, So yeah, just so to date, just the energy versus diesel cost, because I know this is the type of stuff that um, people like to see. So as an example, you know, just switching from diesel to electric, we're able to save, you know, about 50%, let's say, of the energy costs on the equivalent diesel. So that's a kind of a no-brainer. So, you know, this type of data being presented to our council on the operating budget side of things is kind of an eye opener because you know there's different funding sources for operating budgets versus you know capital budgets. So this is all tax levy, property tax, that type of thing. So to date, uh, similarly, we have uh, with our 12 buses or so on service, uh, about 700 tons of CO2 as kind of the net savings. So that's looking at you know an equivalent diesel bus versus a uh, an electric bus. Um, and then, yeah, just if I can, the last, the lessons learned here. So I think, at least in our case, with the data that we've been able to collect and report, it's, it's clear that, you know, re GHD reductions and oper operational savings are real. And they just, it's the exercise of collecting the data and, and making sure that it's digestible for people to kind of understand. Um, one of the challenges there is everyone, even in the transit world, everybody kind of calculates things differently. I think there's some, there'd be some benefit if we were all talking the same language in terms of using the same standards. Um, we do have to engage with our industry partners more often uh, to understand their pressures, just like manufacturing capacity, you know, availability of uh, supply chain, or sorry, availability of parts, supply chain, things of that nature. And the, the one thing that we're dealing with now, which is good, because we're here at, at Brock and hopefully, you know, this institution and other word, others uh, across uh, Canada will be able to kind of bring in that next generation of skill set that we need. Uh, there's a big demand. There's a high demand right now. There's not a lot of people out there who have the expertise with battery electric bus technology. Everyone's fighting for resources, um, and, and we need that kind of workforce uh, to support uh, our goals and initiatives. And then lastly, yeah, it takes partnerships. So this is just some of the people that we've worked with along the way. Uh, the transit agencies all, you know, work together, share information. I think, you know, what we've learned through this is we also have to engage with utilities, uh, manufacturers, um, and any type of, you know, like think tank consortiums of, for, these, uh, for these different uh, sectors. Um, to kind of learn and see where we can all kind of work together to, to deliver on some of our, our goals and targets and, and our programs. So that's the end of uh, the presentation. Hopefully, 
didn't go too much over time. Two questions. <laughs> the best two, if there are any. <laughs> it take the project on like are you executing it yourself or have you worked with like power on or a company like that yeah so so at the moment on the fleet side uh, everything is being self-performed so we're procuring doing everything on our own on the facility side yeah we're evaluating uh, the different models that are out there so you mentioned like power on and, and those types of agencies um, so I think, I think from, from our perspective, what we want to do is similar to here is make sure from a business case, whatever model makes sense that we land on, that we ultimately go out and procure uh, is, is the best one for York Region. So there hasn't been anything um, firm landed on at the moment, but yeah, we're evaluating all of those options. There's one more over there. Hi, can you comment on how the en route uh, charging works and what kind of challenges you ran into with the uh, training? Yeah, so it's, uh, it's just the one that we have at least is a Siemens overhead uh, charger. I'll see if, I think there's a picture here. Oh, well, there you go. It's on one of the slides. But uh, pretty much it's a, it's a 450 kilowatt, this thing, uh, overhead charger. Um, it's located at one of our terminals um, and it operates I don't know, 21 hours of the day, let's say, is, uh, when our service is, uh, is out on street. In terms of challenges, um, this, is, this comes in like two big parts uh, from Siemens. So just logistics of shipping is one big thing. The second part was the installation. So Siemens supported us locally, but the, the real designers, builders, experts are out in Germany somewhere. So we had to, you know, work on weird hours if we had any questions about installation. There was only a couple of these installed, one in Quebec, one in BC. No one had really installed them in the area, in the type of area that we were proposing, which was uh, not 100% flat. Um, so there were some challenges there. And then in terms of the uh, demarcation points, so this one was a little bit of a touchy one with uh, our local, uh, so Newmarket Hydro, the local utility. It's, it's different than what they would typically do, whereas you, know, you have to connect, you can only have one service per address kind of deal, so getting into the logistics of, okay, well this is new, can we figure something out, it needs a new transformer, whatever it is. Um, things of that nature. So everything was really just new for everybody who was touching it along the way, whether they were designing it, constructing it, or providing service to it. And then in terms of operations, one thing we, we've evolved over the years for the last three years is there has been improvements to the technology made because there was a lot of sensitivity initially with weather, precipitation, moisture, you name it. Uh, false charges, things of that nature. Uh, so we've had to kind of develop things, provide our feedback, and, and fortunately with you know Siemens and Newmarket Hydro, we've been able to kind of not have as much downtime. I think we're like 95% plus now on downtime when it was near 40 in like year one. So. Okay, one last one. <laughs> Just a quick question, thank you. Yeah. Um, so you referenced the, the investment of 1.7 versus 2.5. Did yeah. that factor in operational costs as well or just the capital replacement? Yeah, that was just the capex. So it would be, it was like for like. So, so on our diesel buses, we have two different uh, life cycles. So our, we have a 12 and an 18 year life cycle. Depending on the bus, it goes through an overhaul. So engines and transmissions uh, at varying years. So it was taking a look at, you know, equivalent if we were to have an electric bus the electric bus battery replacement, things of that nature, um, compared side by side. So it was strictly capital, capital costs, as well as the infrastructure side. So, you know, if we were just business as usual, continuing to run diesel, um, we would still need to, as an example, replace or refurbish diesel tanks, things of that nature, 
Uh, and then on the electric bus side, it's charging infrastructure, transformers, switch gears, all that type of stuff. So it was all kind of looked side by side. And yeah, I guess it was roughly 800 million was the premium that uh, our, our council had to look at and make a decision on. Okay, thank you. Come back. He'll come back. <laughs> thank you very much, Richard. I know that we will be inspired here with our newly formed Niagara Region Transit Commission and lots of lessons to be learned from the work from your leadership. Um, next speaker, uh, we'd like to invite Gil Amdursky to present. Gil is a certified measurement and verification professional and certified energy manager that has been with the Sustainable Technologies Evaluation Program of the Toronto and Region Conservation Authority since 2010. During this time, Gil has led and contributed to a variety of studies evaluating the performance of renewable energy technologies and low carbon technologies for buildings with a recent emphasis on heat pumps. Gil is a passionate advocate for sustainability and a regular presenter of STEP research. He holds a diploma in electromechanical engineering from George Brown College and a postgraduate certificate in renewable energies from the University of Toronto. Gil is also a proud owner of a cold climate air source heat pump. <laughs> Please welcome Gil to the podium. That's my It's okay, I only have uh, like 28 slides to go through in 20 minutes. So that's, that's, that's fine, we can do this. Um, all right, we did that. Uh, so just a bit about what I'm gonna be talking about today. Um, we're going to do a bit of an intro into uh, what our group is, STEP, which is Sustainable Technologies Evaluation Program. We're going to take just a few slides to look at general sustainability uh, in an energy standpoint within TRCA and its buildings. Um, but we're mainly going to focus on, uh, oh, it's, it's doing it, it's keeping me on time. Uh, hang on a second, we're going to focus on what we call the Smarter Home Heating Campaign, uh, which is educating a number of audiences on air source heat pumps and heat pumps. Uh, so yeah, that, that's me, proud papa of a, a cold climate air source heat pump. Uh, that's me in my basement painting uh, clothes, outside work clothes. Um, and uh, there was already an introduction, so we can, we can speed up there. Uh, work out of the, the STEP program. So this is part of the Toronto and Region Conservation Authority. We're a bit unique in that we do energy and sustainability research, um, yeah, heavily on the energy side. Um, we have a water side that looks at low impact development, green infrastructure, stormwater technologies. Um, but we've done kind of energy research uh, for almost 20 years now. Our main work has come historically out of the Archetype Sustainable House. Um, that's around, uh, in, in Vaughan, around the uh, Canada's Wonderland. So that's a big landmark. It's about five minutes from there, if anybody's familiar with that. And yeah, so we use this house as kind of a laboratory. We've had over 20 different mechanical systems there. Um, uh, cold climate air source heat pumps that have run to, you know, the coldest temperatures we've seen in the past 15 years. Uh, some of our decarbonization efforts, we have lots of different kind of field buildings and field centers throughout the TRCA. Uh, Black Creek Pioneer Village, uh, we had a, uh, a VRF retrofit around 2019. Uh, that came along with a, a boiler retrofit uh, and some ERV, HRV work as well. Um, we have the, the, the Courtright Center, um, it's Visitor Center, it's about, uh, I think, a, a 15,000 square foot multi-use building. Um, it had a geothermal retrofit around 2012 or something like that, and we recent, recently did a, a recommissioning on it as well. Uh, then we have a Restoration Services building, a 12,000 square foot uh, lead platinum building uh, with geothermal, uh, and we also do in-floor cooling with the geothermal too, but that's also combined with uh, air as well. Uh, and our new head office, um, if anyone's familiar with the U of T 
Black Creek Pioneer Village, what is now called the Village Area. It's right around there, and it's going to be a lead platinum, net zero carbon, and well silver, and might as well tack on a few other uh, on onto that. Um, a really neat open loop geothermal system this, uh, this building is going to have, uh, as well as some other neat features like uh, uh, mechanical automated natural ventilation and, and uh, lots of other cool features. And it, it's, it is a mass timber building. You can see in the picture there all the kind of mainly wood. Um, yeah, so that was just a highlight. I know when I spoke to the group earlier, they said, well, can we highlight some of TRCA's work on sustainability, so that was that. But today I'm going to focus mainly on the Smarter Home Heating Campaign. Um, so it's got three main assets, data collection and analysis, which is what kind of our group is, is really well known for, is, is research. Um, then creation of assets and tools, I'm going to go through this as we go along, um, and communications, marketing, getting that data and information out there. Um, so why is the campaign important? Um, so lack of awareness we find is big in, in lots of different audiences and quite often even you know, in, in this audience too um, because we're not always right in front of heat pump and heat pump research. We're all doing kind of different things. Um, there's lots of different information out there. There's many organizations, many contractors, uh, even energy advisors that are kind of saying somewhat different things. Um, so we're here basically to uh, deliver and to showcase real world data. We're not biased, nonprofit. So I'm just gonna go through all of the kind of assets and, and, uh, and things that we've, uh, we've done throughout the campaign. Uh, and then I'm gonna talk a little bit about the lessons learned. So case studies, uh, so far we've had about 2,500 unique uh, views of our case studies. Um, the program started in 2022, by the way, beginning of 2022. Um, so we have five of these kind of traditional case studies that are, that are PDFs, and um, the last two we've now made into like an HTML into a more accessible format, and they will be that HTML accessible format moving forward. So these are basically very compact, kind of one, one page or two page documents that highlight individual homeowners' experiences with heat pumps. We also collect data. We do a full M&V on the data as well. We look at capital costs. And so we highlight, oh, it's doing the thing for me. Uh, we, we highlight what the actual um, capital costs are, what the expected energy savings are, and yeah, we evaluate each of the homeowners two years pre-data uh, and one, at minimum one year post-retrofit uh, data. Uh, we have a heat pump uh, Q&A portal on the Smarter Home Heating uh, website. This is where literally anybody can just log in and uh, ask us questions. So far we've had about 20 or so um, questions come in. We don't really advertise this that much because we're afraid that we're going to get a lot of questions asked and uh, might not have the capacity for it. Uh, but it is live on our website. Uh, we've been featured in, in multiple news media. Uh, sometimes it's organically they reach out to us, sometimes we reach out to them, but we find it's really important to kind of get this, these stories out there. We've been featured in, in The Star and lots of other locations here. Um, webinars and events, <clears throat> um, a lot of it in the beginning was, you know, uh, webinars, virtual events, uh, a lot more in-person events happening uh, nowadays. Uh, so we've had over 1,500 attendees that we've tracked, again, since beginning of 2022 uh, in, again, mostly webinars to lots of different kinds of audiences. Most of them are associations, uh, Architects Association, Professional, <laughs> professional Engineers Ontario, um, and a lot of them are, are homeowner groups as, as well. And we have a homeowner video testimonial series. We have put together five of these so far. They are on YouTube. Um, the best one is uh, Keith Burroughs. I don't know if anybody recognizes that face, uh, but he's got almost 3,000 hits. Uh, go Keith. Uh, and, and basically, uh, similar story as the uh, 
uh, case studies, we just ask, oh, actually, wait, I, I sliced together a few of these. And don't mind, there's lots of breaks in the middle because I, I don't know how to video edit. But this should play in a second. It really wasn't invasive. Um, there's an air handler that replaced our existing furnace. Uh, and the air handler integrated right with our existing ducts. So it was, the installation was really uh, quite straightforward. It has heated my home in winter, cooled it in summer uh, for two years and a bit at exactly the same running cost as gas. So it's been a triumph. I think installing a heat pump should be a default when a homeowner is trying to replace their old uh, existing AC unit. Um, there are different types of heat pump for different every kind of homes or application. And by doing that, you, you have a benefit of lowering emission, also trying to lower your cost of heating through the, the, the cost of the natural gas. So again, I would recommend everybody to, to do this. It's just a little taste of kind of what the videos look like there. They're kind of two to four minute things and we kind of ask the same questions of each homeowner. Um, and yeah, everybody seems to seems to love this this series here. Um, surveys, we, we've done three sets of surveys, one to homeowners, one to energy advisors, and one to contractors. Um, the homeowner survey was uh, sent out uh, last year, last summer, and then we evaluated it um, around December. Um, we received about 18 responses. Um, it's funny because we, we put it out publicly and we said that the first 25 people would receive a $25 gift card, but there were some conditions, like they had to send us a picture of their heat pump and some information, and we received 500 responses. Uh, but then we had to painstakingly go through all of them and realize that they were all bogus, like all robot fakes. Anyways, so don't publicly offer incentives <laughs> for surveys. Um, but basically for the homeowners, we, we were asking, you know, what were the challenges? How did, how did you find out about heat pumps? Do you like your heat pump? Overwhelming majority are satisfied with their heat pumps. Um, and uh, they didn't report significant barriers to installation or things like that. And most of them, I have them in my notes, but my notes aren't here. Uh, but most of them... Um, Mouth, word of mouth internet search and then the 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 other there is like how they found out about heat pumps is um, that they were like in the industry or already knew about energy efficiency um, but um, most of it that we find um, besides this survey uh, like the case studies that we've done it's mostly been word of mouth it's like oh my neighbor did it or oh I know someone who's a contractor um, surveys for energy advisors um, so we re received some interesting information here, and basically, um, yeah, we got 25 responses. Uh, we sent it through Windfall as well as um, Casey, which is like the Canadian Association for something. I'm sorry, I don't know. It's an Energy Advisor Association. Um, uh, some of them felt that like there weren't sufficient um, tools to help um, educate their their clients. Um, and there's a bit more information there. I'm, I'm moving too slowly. Um, then we have a survey for contractors. Sorry, the, the energy advisor survey and the contractor survey, we will be releasing public information on it. We're still analyzing it. So if you have more questions about it, we will have it out soon. Um, the contractor survey, we actually got 48 responses, which is great. We um, also incentivized these surveys, but these were sent through um, HREI and windfall directly to contractors, so it wasn't public. Um, 
and yeah, for the contractors, what, what was really interesting we found is like the, the anecdotal or the typed responses. Um, so some of them in the gray you can see below, they're saying, you know, education is key, homeowners and contractors alike, which is really interesting for a contractor to say. And then, you know, some of them were saying things like that, that it's kind of really eye-opening, you know, like uh, clients and natural gas change their minds uh, when they get the price. Um, but we know that, you know, this is not the case. Like even for natural gas right now, we know that it could be essentially the same operating cost and in most cases actually lower. Um, and then we asked them about barriers preventing homeowners um, from ad adoption. And the main one there is, is upfront cost. Um, infographics, this is, this is something we haven't released yet, but we are working on. Um, so we have kind of like a, a single image series and then one that's a bit um, longer, kind of a little explainer. Um, so we're still working on that and hoping to have it out by end of this year. <clears throat> then we have our, our guidance documents. This one is actually still draft, but it's on its like last draft. We think we're going to be releasing it very soon. We've heard from energy advisors, from contractors, from distributors and manufacturers as well, like, hey, do you have a little one-pager? And so we kind of put this together, um, sort of a, you know, what is an air source heat pump? And kind of taking our knowledge and the data that we've collected and trying to fit it all into one page, which is very hard to do. There was so many more words here that I had to go to my coworkers and be like, no, cut it, cut it shorter. Um, yeah, social media has been kind of um, organic. We haven't done any paid pushes yet. We plan on doing it towards the end of this year um, when, our, when we have more of those assets uh, fully finished. Um, but we still have some, some pretty good views. And um, the, it's funny because like my own personal one, that picture of me with the heat pump, I put that one on LinkedIn and I got like 50,000 impressions. So the, 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 the more personal ones uh, are the ones where you get more hits. Um, this is what the, the website looks like right now. So far, since the beginning of 2022, we've had 4,500 unique visitors. And uh, the main cities are kind of like Mississauga, Toronto, and then it's kind of, it's split for third place. And it's like, it goes all the way to Ottawa, there's Hamilton, it's, it's all over the place. Um, it's a really busy website right now. We're planning on in the next phase of the project perhaps creating a micro page, something that's more focused on that project. Because like right now the page has our kind of step and our banner and all the things that you could do within the step website. Anyways, uh, and we have really good engagement. So three minutes, three and a half, around three and a half minutes um, each, uh, each uh, person is, is staying at the website. Um, so the main lessons learned We've, we've been evaluating heat pumps and, and air source heat pumps for, for like almost 15 years now. Um, uh, we, we know the technology works. We know that it works in, in really cold temperatures. Um, we know that it's readily available and anyone can do it and there's almost no home that doesn't work. We know that they save money, they save carbon, they save gas. Um, they operate at really high efficiencies uh, and they can be cost effective. I, we've seen, you know, heat pumps go from like the $20,000 price range of 10 or so years ago. Uh, and right now you can buy like a, a, a coil only heat pump, which is c almost exactly like an air conditioner where you have an outdoor unit and an indoor unit. And that can pretty much do a, a modest sized whole heating load. And we've seen units that are like four or $5,000 installed. So the that they are becoming really cost um, con competitive. Um, but it also requires knowledge um, and uh, professional installation. For homeowners, we know that they are satisfied. Um, the overwhelming majority of them are, are satisfied with heat pumps. Um, we know what homeowners care about. Um, a lot of them are motivated by kind of you know, climate change and um, lowering greenhouse gases. But for the ones that aren't, we know that they care about um, economics, comfort, value, uh, overall aesthetics. And so we know that air source heat pumps uh, uh, 
have all those kind of value and, and, and features, right? So we need to really sell that. Um, we can't necessarily expect homeowners to make the right decision if they're not informed. You know, if their furnace breaks and they call up a contractor, uh, you know, and the contractor says to just get a new furnace, that's likely what's gonna happen. So we need to get information in front of people. We need to really raise the awareness. For contractors, awareness is the big thing as well. Um, another thing, like we've been working also with Natural Resources Canada on sizing and right sizing. Um, they have their heat pump sizing and selection tool, which is gonna be turned into an online tool very, very shortly. Um, but we know that we've, we've heard some stories about, about sizing. So, so training and awareness is, is key. Um, I have in brackets there, here and there, I say some contractors, because there are some contractors that are, are really good and do know what they're doing. Um, I, I think what's gonna be hard is a lot of people are saying that contractors need training. However, we can't force that training upon them in any way, so if they don't wanna take it, they, they don't have to. Um, uh, a lot of contractors uh, has, still have a belief that you know, air source heat pumps or heat pumps in general don't work because they installed one 15 years ago and, and it was crap, right? Um, so we need to kind of put more real life information in front of them to help them change their minds. You know, one thing that we get a lot from contractors, homeowners, all sorts of audiences is like, well, the temperature is really, really cold here and like heat pumps can't, can't handle it. You know, here's a, a distribution graph of, of like Toronto. It's actually average of a bunch of um, Toronto weather stations. But you can see like minus 20, below minus 20, it's a handful of hours per year that we're actually below minus 20. And to be honest, most of the heat pumps, like most of the cold climate heat pumps, they, they can keep up at that temperature. Right, so when people say like, oh, but it gets too cold and we can't handle it. Oh, here's my turn now. Um, <laughs> gonna go quickly here. Uh, this is like second or third last slide. So um, actionable insights. So for homeowners, pr promotion is key. Um, homeowner awareness, obviously. Um, for contractors, um, we need to like support them. So not try and, and force training and ed education, uh, but but like support them, be like, hey, this is how you can help to sell the heat pumps, right? Rather than, uh, you know, this is the education that you need. Um, and then uh, for, for all audiences, um, again, awareness, getting more information in, in front of people. This means partnering with lots of different organizations, speaking at events, community organizations are really, really powerful, um, which is what we found, but that, takes a lot of manpower and coordination to kind of reach out to all these individual community groups and communicate with them. Um, coaching and advising is very helpful. So for those um, regions and municipalities that have home energy programs, uh, we found that the coaching or energy concierge service, um, it, it really helps and has uh, long lasting um, effects. And then the, the last insight is that th there's no reason anyone should ever be installing an air conditioner only uh, moving forward. You know, install a heat pump. It is essentially an air conditioner, but it can also provide heating. Um, what's next? Uh, we are currently putting together a framework, or charter, if you will, of what the next two years of this program looks like. Um, the first phase, this phase now, ending this calendar year, it was funded by the Atmospheric Fund and City of Toronto. Um, Next year, unfortunately, TAF has told us, hey, we don't fund continuation of projects, which is what they see it. Um, so we have to uh, you know, go after some, some funding. So if anybody has any ideas or if they want to support the program, um, come and chat. And uh, yeah, we really do want to expand on the technologies, though, that we showcase and the different kind of archetypes that we showcase as well. So we want to focus on you know, rural homes. We want to focus on geothermal. Um, heat pump water heaters, heat pump pool heaters, and then also look at the um, uh, small to mid commercial as well. And yeah, that's that's it. Thanks. Is that okay? Is that one question? One.
<laughs> She's saying one question. <laughs> Fine, come, come chat with me after if there's more. Can I ask a quick question? I'm also a proud heat pump owner, um, but I was shocked to learn when I was going through the whole process of replacing my home HVAC system, or my home heating system, that it is also an air conditioner. And I know you touched on it really briefly at the end, but can you talk more about the functionality of heating and cooling pumps? For sure, yeah. So um, an air conditioner is a heat pump. Um, it just doesn't have a few parts to make it go in reverse, right? So um, your air conditioner, what it's doing is, so I, I think most of you have air conditioners, but if you go to your air conditioner when it's running in the summertime and you put your hand on top of it, you can feel heat, right? So where is that heat coming from? That heat is coming from inside your house, right? So it is pumping heat literally heat pump, it's in the name. So your house is hot, it's taking heat from inside your house, it's pumping it outside. That's how we make cool in our houses in the summertime. You can't actually make cool, you remove heat, right? Um, so the, the heat pump, the air source heat pump, is essentially the reverse. But it's the, it's the same piece of technology. They're just putting in a few other things in there. There's like a reversing valve, and then there's a few other small pieces of equipment that they put in there to make it a, a heat pump. Um, and so in the wintertime, if we have our heat pump, which again, looks, can look exactly like the air conditioner. Um, even in really, really cold temperatures, we can withdraw heat out of the outside and we pump that heat um, inside. Uh, another very quick example is your refrigerator, your fr fridge and freezer. Um, the, the, the box, the freezer, is really cold. It's like minus 20, 20 degrees, right? Um, anybody remember those old fridges and freezers that had the coil in the back? Yeah, what did that coil feel like? Hot, yeah, because it's pumping heat, right? It's this, the same thing that's going on in there. And you're thinking, where is that heat coming from? Believe it or not, that heat is coming from that minus 20 degree box. There's still heat in there, right? There's always heat being introduced in there. You open the door, you're introducing heat in there. It's got really crappy insulation that's introducing heat in there. It's got a crappy air seal as well. And you're always putting new things in there um, that's also introducing heat in there. So it works it, it pretty much exactly the same as that. And I can only take one question. Is that correct? All right, come, come chat. <laughs> come chat with me later. Thank you. So, thank you very much. Thank you. There's more questions later. Ooh, okay. Oh, the phone too. Oh, and the water There's too. more opportunity for questions later in the panel as well. Um, but, you know, the previous two speakers really spoke to big change, big, complex, large community projects. But we want to ensure we're not missing a significant portion of energy users and contributors to greenhouse gas emissions, which is our existing building stock, and that's our residential homes. And what we do know with community energy planning is that about 50 to 75% of our existing building stock will need to be retrofitted. And a solution for that, for many of those homes, would be heat pumps. So this is a very important um, initiative or action that communities need to take and the homeowners need to look at when they're retrofitting their home. So thank you so much, Go. Our last speaker for the morning is Jeff Olson. He, I am a super fan of End Wave, where uh, Jeff is coming from. Jeff has overseen partnerships for Enwave for the past five years, interfacing with the building ownership and development community to leverage Enwave expertise and in infrastructure to deliver to delivery, low deliver low carbon and low energy solutions for buildings. A veteran of the green building industry, his areas of expertise include district energy, geothermal, lighting and lighting controls, HVAC, building automation, and glazing. Jeff is a graduate of McMaster University with a degree in mechanical engineering and business management and is a member of the Professional Engineers of Ontario. Please welcome Jeff. Thank you, Suzanne. Um, 
Hi, I'm Jeff, and I'm really excited to be here today to introduce you to N-Wave. I'm also going to give a very special thanks to Mary and, and Gil for really doing half of my presentation for me, uh, which is fantastic, because we're going to be covering district energy and heat pumps. Um, and quite frankly, I want to get to the question part, and I hope I get more than one, so I'm going to keep this cooking. So. We, we know what district energy systems are already. Instead of central plants on single buildings, we're talking about groups of buildings, ideally really big groups of buildings. I actually took this picture from the top of the CN Tower a, uh, a few years ago, and from this particular angle, these are the buildings, some of the 90 million square feet of downtown Toronto that N-Wave heats and cools. Now, we are probably best known as the Deep Lake Water Cooling Company, Frankly, it's a great way to be known. Um, what this is, is uh, it was a partnership early on with the City of Toronto to be able to run uh, pipes deep within Lake Ontario to take very cold, very deep water and then cool much of downtown Toronto with that water. So uh, let's talk about what this actually looks like. If I put a camera the, at the bottom of the lake, about five kilometers out, this is what the skyline would look like. And you see these three now newly installed four pipes that are, uh, that are there. I might need help from you to cue the video. And, uh, and so those, those very deep intake pipes come in to the, uh, the Toronto Island water filtration plant. These pipes are actually the city of Toronto's pipes. How are we doing? Not going to work? We'll just do it verbally. So the, uh, those pipes come into the island. We now have uh, v still very, very cold water. The treatment plant, of course, cleans the water and gets it ready for the, the city's drinking water supply. That water then is then piped under the inner harbor to our heat exchange facility where we take the chill from that water, put it in our own pipes, and then distribute that cooling to, as I said, up uh, tens of millions of square feet of, of downtown Toronto. So it's an amazing piece of infrastructure that we're, we're able to leverage. Now, N-Wave is more than just a deep lake water cooling company and more than just Toronto. We have uh, uh, several systems across eastern Canada. Kind of exciting things happening in other places as well. The, uh, in, in Charlottetown, we run a waste-to-energy facility. So we're taking much of the island's uh, garbage, converting it into low-carbon heat source, and then heating much of downtown Charlottetown with that source. In, I'm going to talk about N-Wave Markham in a bit, where we are running a geo-exchange system for single-family homes. In uh, London, we actually have a combined heat and power plant where we generate electricity, but then also use the heat from that process to heat downtown London. And in Windsor, we have more of a typical boiler and chiller system. So what I want to do today, though, I do want to talk, I, again, thank you, Mary, for covering district energy. That's fantastic. We know what, what that's about. I'm going to show you some of the ways that you can think big and have big projects um, that, that are enabled by district energy. But I don't want to forget part of the reason I'm here is to talk about our business model, because we see ourselves as an enabler of low carbon energy projects. We're working in those cities that I mentioned, but we're growing from there to, to many other systems. I'm going to talk about some of those projects and business models. But very plainly, we are a designer, builder, owner and financer, and an operations and maintenance team for these systems. Okay, so we are owned by the Ontario Teachers Pension Plan, as well as a partner pension plan, IFM. So we have, and those are, we're a long-term hold asset for those pension funds. And that enables us to be the, uh, to deploy capital to enable this whole process. So I want to, I'm trying to fill you with a bit of excitement for the possibilities here. And one of the things that we bring is we enable these big projects to happen by, again, financing, designing, and all the way through to our key competency, which is operations and maintenance of these systems. Okay, now I want to do a little bit of show and tell on some of the projects that we have. These will mainly be pictures because I think that's uh, the way I like to present. So that's a bit of a map of our downtown Toronto infrastructure. Um, if you look at what looks like a kind of gleaming golden town off to the side there, that's a project called The Well. And uh, many of you may have heard of this. This at one point was one of the largest uh, development projects in North America. This is, uh, is 3.5 million square feet of mixed use, commercial, residential, retail, all being built all at once. Now, this is a rendering of what the, uh, the well uh, is and was to look like. Um, if you notice underneath there, you see what looks like a kind of a, an underground silo. This was part of the magic at the well uh, that we wanted to bring deep lake water cooling there, but we needed more capacity. So we installed a giant thermal storage asset, a giant water tank, basically. 
Mary, I noticed in your presentation you showed a giant above-ground tank. Now, sadly, I mean, unlike Brock, we don't have space to put above-ground tanks in Toronto, so we had to move them subterranean, which really made quite an engineering project out of it. So that's what I want to highlight right now. I took this picture from the edge of the construction site when it was ongoing. You can just see how massive this site is. You can see how many towers are lined up along the, uh, the, the south side of this, this, this dig. Now, if you, I'm going to zoom in on this box here because this is the, uh, the, the, the hole in the ground that I was referencing. So this hole in the ground is 55 feet across, and by the time we dug down and down and down and down and down, we bottomed out at about 150 feet below parking level six. So we, they went down to parking level six and then we went an additional 150 feet. So this now giant uh, tank, which is now slip lined with concrete, fully filled with fluid and is already operational on our system, was again enabled by a district energy system and enabled by, this is you know, quite a capital project, was enabled by our, our, uh, our business model at N-Wave. Okay, um, and uh, I was like, sorry, Mary, I keep referring to you here. We were just chatting after the, the, the presentation about deep lake water cooling was originally meant, uh, was just to cool downtown Toronto, but it's actually become an enabler of decarbonized heating. So I want to talk about how we do that. And, and Gil, you mentioned, I'm so glad you covered heat pumps because you mentioned that cooling is not a thing, heat is a thing, right? Heat pumps move heat from one place to another. So when we are cooling downtown Toronto, and ironically, we cool in the dead of winter, data centers, exteriors of buildings, etc., hospitals. That is the collection of heat. So if you picture our cold water lines, okay, they, they go out uh, with, with cold water, buildings deposit their heat into our system, and that comes back to a plant like the Pearl Street Energy Center as warm water. And then what we are currently under construction, we have two of these plants operational right now. This is our third and biggest heat pump plant where we're going to take that heat out of the cold water returns and then move it into our new hot water network as fully decarbonized, or I'll say fully electrified, low-carbon heat. So I think it's just an amazing story that started 20, 30 years ago with deep lake water cooling and has moved into low-carbon heating. Um, I'm also, I also want to touch on some of our other business models. I've been focusing on our downtown districts, uh, which are you know, a core and anchor part of our business. We have two new business lines that we're getting into, um, one being N-Wave Geo Communities. So that's actually a single building, that is to say non-district, single building uh, geothermal geo exchange business as well as community energy planning where we start brand new districts from scratch. I'm going to talk about both of those. So I know we, uh, thank you, Gil, you talked about uh, heat pumps, but specifically um, uh, geo exchange is the use of uh, heat pumps um, to exchange heat with the earth. Now, just uh, some terminology here. We hear a lot about geothermal. Okay? Now, that word simply means earth heat. And that covers, it's like an umbrella term that covers all sorts of technologies from, say, electrical generation from volcanoes in Iceland, all the way to this technology, geo exchange, where we're using heat pumps to seasonally exchange heat with the bedrock, the ground underneath the building. So uh, um, again, Gil, you highlighted this, when you're cooling a building all summer long, generally an air source heat pump would blow that heat off into the air. But what we're doing is using a water source heat pump to move the heat from the building into fluid. And then we circulate that fluid underground in the bedrock from many, many boreholes. And if you picture as you're cooling the whole summer long, what do you think is happening to the earth? Now this is hard to be interactive like this. It, thank you. The earth is heating up seasonally. So at the end of your cooling season, you have warmer than average rock underneath the, uh, the, the building, and then you invert the, uh, with those reversing valves that you mentioned, you invert the, uh, the heat pump to now pull the heat back out of the ground, back into the building. So that's what geo exchange is. It's, it's seasonal exchange with uh, the earth. And then again, a little bit about our business model. Um, we talked, I heard mention of the, some of the high costs of geo exchange, the capital, initial capital costs. Via N-Wave Geo Communities, it allows us and you know, the funding that we get from the, the teachers as investment, 
to capitalize that asset. So we become the designers, uh, builders, and owners of the geothermal asset for the building, for a single building. And then we, uh, we, we, uh, we have a long-term sort of fee structure that allows, and this is very important on all, we primarily focus on condominiums for this model. We make sure that the future owners of the condos are not, underscored not, being burdened with additional operational costs. So they're made whole and stayed neutral, and then we, in many cases, can get to cost neutrality for the developer as well, depending on drilling conditions, but we can get pretty close to it. So it's really, this is a model to get GeoExchange out there into the market. We're doing it right now with, uh, with several projects, and it's really expanding and blowing up right now. And I also wanted to talk about um, our community energy planning part of our business. Now this is similar to the big downtown districts that I talked about. This is the founding and starting of district energy systems from scratch. So generally big greenfield, brownfield projects that are being uh, done that we want to be the developer of choice for that district energy system. I'm going to highlight really quickly three of these projects, starting with the Etobicoke Civic Center. This was a partnership between N-Wave and the City of Toronto. It's not only the Civic Center itself, but it's about six development blocks surrounding the Civic Center. The technology being utilized here will be that aforementioned geo-exchange. So we're putting boreholes across the, um, the whole development block. All of those boreholes, this is kind of unique, is coming back to a central plant. So this is both geo-exchange and district energy. And so it comes into that central district uh, uh, plant and then we, we run hot water and chilled water out to all of the development blocks here. Um, so this will be, I think, one of the largest urban bore fields and one of the, one of the largest geo-exchange projects in Canada. And I'm happy to say we're in construction right now. The boreholes are going in the ground and it's happening. So very exciting uh, for us. Um, Lakeview Village, this is an even bigger uh, development project that I'm again happy to say we're, we're under construction right now on. Um, I know we're, we're in Niagara, I'm in Toronto, many of you travel between the two. You probably remember the Lakeview Coal Generating Station, the, the four giant smokestacks that used to be in South Mississauga. When it was torn down in 06, it was always slated to become this. And uh, it's, it's, it's go. The first condos are going to be uh, putting shovels in the ground soon. Uh, so Lakeview Village is what it's called. We are going to be the district thermal low carbon energy provider for this in partnership again with the city of Mississauga and the developers of the site to name a few Argo and Tridel. And this is, this is neat, this is exciting. Uh, we're, we're back to heat pumps, right? Where we, we can talk about exchanging with the earth. There is a very large uh, water treatment plant right next to this site. And what, uh, you know, it's treating sewage and um, sounds gross, but when that water goes back to the lake currently, it's warm. So that's a missed opportunity to, and so what we're gonna be doing is we're gonna be attaching giant heat pumps and heat exchangers to the effluent from that plant, pulling all of that, uh, that warmth out and heating, and this is uh, when it's all built out, will be 16 million square feet of built environments, all low carbon, and, uh, and, uh, and done in partnership. So uh, again, under construction, very excited about this one. And um, I am, I'll just jump right to this, uh, this last example. This is a partnership with the city of Markham and Mattamy Homes where we took a brand new uh, single family home development and we decarbonized the whole thing by GeoExchange again. And this is a, a, a unique kind of version of GeoExchange where there is no central plant all, all the hundreds of houses on this development block are all tied together, though, with a, what's called an ambient loop. So not really hot or really cold water, but just kind of a neutral temperature water that, that's, that are sharing the energy. And each home will have a heat pump in it. And instead of an air source heat pump, it's a water source or ground source heat pump. And it's going to be taking, again, the heat out of all of these buildings all summer long, putting it into this loop. And then the bore field is actually in the right of way. So this is, again, a partnership with the city of Markham to be able to put that bore field in the right of way. And I wanted to, again, show some more pictures. Um, uh, and this, I think, you'll find interesting how a geo exchange is, is constructed. So that's what a geo exchange borehole drill rig looks like. 
And that drill rig would go down 850 feet. I, I heard you say uh, 400 feet being tested here in Niagara. That's fantastic. We had to go to 850 feet to get the right load uh, um, in Markham. That's what the top of one of those boreholes looked like. That is an 850 foot deep hole in the ground. Don't drop anything down that hole. Um, and then what you do is you take this prefabricated U-shaped loop and you stuff the U end of that loop right here, you, we're stuffing that U-shaped loop down 850 feet. The third pipe that you see there is to inject mortar. So you fill the entire cavity with mortar to ensure thermal conductivity. Um, I love this picture because this is one of the future streets that is, you can see our boreholes kind of sticking out with the pigtails from the ends of the U-loops there. Um, then the, uh, it all got filled in. All of those pipes that were there are interconnected and, and come to headers in the street. So when you, you know, open up a service hatch, you'll, you'll, uh, you'll see this uh, piping and pumping network there. Um, and this is the foundations of one of the homes. You can see the black um, uh, pipes come up into the home. This is, I, we already saw one picture of a, of a heat pump in, in, a, uh, in, a, in a home. This is just, this is what it is. It's in a, a heat pump and air handler in the home. Really, to the homeowner, it looks just like a furnace. Really nothing too different. Um, and uh, this is a picture of the streets now. So, um, thank you very much for your time. You see, I kind of raced through that. Do we get more than one question? All right. <laughs> Any questions? Yes. Uh, are you um, are you also locating uh, natural gas as part of that process? And what are you doing? If you are, what are you doing about it or with it? Yeah, great question. So it, the answer is different on every project. Um, we are advocating, and we are we actually we're responding to projects right now where they're explicitly telling us, "Can you do it with no natural gas?" And the answer is yes. Um, during this transition phase, sometimes I think there is natural gas in that single-family home community, um, albeit it's it's uh, it's not being used for for the heating and cooling of the house. Um, for that large um, new district system at Lakeview, um, we actually uh, the way that it's phased. We're putting up a, a plant, but we can't do effluent right away. There's just too much capital cost involved. So there will be some initial, probably natural gas-based boilers that will all then, when, they, when they it gets built out, be replaced. They'll probably be used for peaking, but then will be replaced with the effluent heat recovery. So the answer is different for, for every project, but the goal is definitely uh, to not require natural gas in the long term. Yep. Is this thing on? For your geo exchange condo project, um, are you thinking of uh, retrofit opportunities as well? I know I'm only saying that because I know like there's a lot of municipalities and regions here, and a lot of them are challenged with, um, let's say, social housing and uh, old age homes and those types of buildings that have like two and four pipe um, uh, boiler or water systems, uh, which would be really ideal for for geothermal. Yes, so um, the low-hanging fruit is new construction. So for all municipalities out there, it's very doable for new construction. Let's check that box. To, to, uh, to retrofit, it is more costly. Um, and so it's not as much the low-hanging fruit. However, um, it's been done. It can definitely be done. Site logistics are different on, uh, on every site. Um, and what you definitely want to do is time it with the renewal of the equipment anyways. Like you referred to, oh, well, if your boiler's up, just put it, the, the maintenance person comes in and puts a new boiler in. That's what you want to avoid. Use that time when you have capital cost, uh, you know, some equipment that has to be done and align it. Um, and, uh, of course, if you have a point tower in, in an urban area, it's harder. But if you had lots of land, putting new uh, boreholes around that is, is doable. So... Um, I, you can probably tell I'm passionate about this stuff. Uh, I heard, I, I'm stealing a joke from somebody, but um, did you know the 100% of buildings are existing buildings? But ouch. So, uh, <laughs> but, so you have to be able to attack the retrofit community to make a big dent. Um, so just consider the new construction low hanging fruit, but we gotta get to retrofit. Okay, um, la last question. Yeah, you mentioned uh, the Toronto is a deep water cooling system. Are you looking at doing any more of those, or is that kind of a unique situation? We will 
for every project that we look at, uh, we do the most cost-effective technology. Uh, I have to sometimes remind people that we are not a deep lake water cooling company. We are a district and thermal company, and we'll use the technology that makes sense. So if, where there's no water, of course, geo exchange. We're very excited about sewer heat waste recovery, because sewers have a lot of uh, latent heat in them, pulling that back out. We actually did a project in Denver uh, that was sewer heat waste. Uh, we mentioned effluent uh, heat recovery. Um, so, um, so yes, we're, we're open to any of those. One more. Yes, sir. And I will also uh, I welcome any uh, questions over lunch as well. I love chatting about this stuff. About waste heat recovery, which is a really cool technology, I have heard, no, I've got brothers in the, in the industry, I've heard that there's problems with acidity, that the heat exchangers can break down in that, that their life cycles aren't quite as long. Is that a problem you've encountered and what have you done with that? And then also, if I can ask too, in Toronto, the closed loop, how many of those, that's a pretty large footprint you have. Um, is that all new construction or did you bring in established buildings into that system? Yeah, so um, the answer about heat pumps, I'm going to just refer to Gil's answer, that there's been all sorts of, you know, heat pumps that have, you know, are old. Oh, I did it 15 years ago, it didn't work out, there were issues. Um, so, no, we are firmly buying into uh, to heat pumps. And you can also kind of um, separate the heat pump from, you know, the, the heat recovery or the geo, or the, like it's, it's a similar piece of technology. It just depends on what the, the ambient heat source is. In our case, for heat recovery downtown, it's our chilled water return lines. Uh, but in the case of, of geo, it's just the, the fluid that's running. But no, we're about wastewater. So um, again, wastewater can be sewers. Wastewater can be effluent. The effluent is easier to do because it's already clean. Now, there's, um, but when it comes to uh, you know sewer heat waste or or, or or other types, you really it's more complicated, and you have to pick the right technology and the right uh, partner. And part of what N Wave and some of other companies do is we take on that risk though, from the municipality, the hospital, or the owner. So when we say you're signing up to deliver the low carbon energy, we have to make it happen, and that risk uh, is on us. But it is more complex, yes. Um, downtown Toronto, uh, early on, it was all retrofit of, of big towers. When we, we first started Deep Lake Water Cooling, it's primarily new construction right now, but we've, we've targeted probably there's another six big towers downtown that we can, uh, we can do retrofits on. Thank you very much, and I look forward to continuing the conversation. Thanks, Susan. Oh, you're tall. You're a lot taller than me. Thank you, Jeff. I think we can all say that you had a very exciting presentation for what could come in the future. Um, so now we're going to take a lunch break. Um, food is upstairs. Elevators are available outside the doors to the right if you need um, the elevator. Um, if you have dietary restrictions, um, the table with those uh, allergies or allergen uh, free are sort of the last table when you get up the stairs. Um, during lunch, please network. We have tables upstairs um, displaying some of the work that's happening with our members of the Niagara Climate Change um, Action Network as well. <laughs> If you, did it, if you did park and you maybe parked in the sort of wrong zone or zone one or you didn't provide us with the correct um, license plate and you do receive a ticket, just bring it in before you leave and it'll, it, it will be taken care of, it will be eliminated. So I just wanted to uh, put that out there. So just to make sure that everyone is leaving happy today. Um, so please enjoy the break. We'll also open the doors and you can go outside. We didn't put tables because we thought it would be a nine degree rainy fall day. We didn't expect the 20 degrees, but the doors will be open for you. So please enjoy. Oh, 